for the love of all that is holy. Do not do this on production. If An AWR report shows a particular SQL as causing lots of server CPU, but we're struggling to find where in our code base it's been generated from. And generated from, I suspect, means it's a dynamically created SQL. We are considering a system-wide trace, but are there other options? This is a, a common problem when you, we see in systems. Most people know that SQL Trace is this fantastic tool. It literally is the definitive performance analysis tool when you really want to dive deep. But sometimes you think, well, where do I turn it on? On what program do I turn it on? What users do I turn it on for? If you can't identify that, then sometimes you think, well, I have to turn it on system-wide. And your biggest fear is, what's that going to do to A, performance? What's it going to do to my diag destination? Is that going to get absolutely mauled, et cetera? There are worries with doing it, and sometimes people think that's our only recourse. So let's explore. Before I do that, I'm going to have, a, I'm going to have two rants. First one is instrumentation. Often when I get asked to help customers with performance issues, this is what you see. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, we have a problem at the moment in our, in our finance application. And you log on to VDollar session and you see something like this. Yep, okay, here's a SQL ID. They go, yeah, this is the problem. This is the problem session. We know there's this session's got a problem. And you, your job is to try and work out what's going on. And every user is called finance because it's coming through an app server. Every program is JDBC and thin client. And so you think, okay, I've narrowed down the, the problem now here to 1 million lines of Java code. That's not very useful. Wouldn't it be beautiful if you could simply log on to the database and query something like this, and it had, oh yes, this session here, it's active, it's the customer's module, and it's a customer inquiry. Ah, I can now go to this little tiny piece of Java or Python or Node or whatever to hone in on where the performance might be. That is one of the cool things with instrumentation, and it's sitting there in the database. Yeah, you know, this is a famous story. I honestly don't know the degree of truth in this story, but it's a famous you know, apocryphal story that we get in the Oracle database that when Oracle early versions of Oracle 7 were being introduced, they were doing a very large benchmark, had a, a problem with a, a particular kernel routine. They couldn't narrow down where the problem was. And so over the weekend, literally Oracle developers plundered the kernel and instrumented the living daylights out of it. And that was effectively the origins of you know, the trace data you get today. The fact that that effectively an emergency session to instrument the living daylights out of the Oracle database. I don't know the degree of truth in that story, but it's certainly one that floats around. But as I said, instrumentation has literally saved the bacon of Oracle many, many, many times. And so if you can instrument your code, it will save you as well. It's, it's so easily and readily available. DBMS application info, you can set the module, set the action, set the client info, simple PL SQL call, job done. And once you do that, the opportunities for you as developers or DBAs become huge because you can do things like this. Here's a session that's active. And the reason it's active is because it's being blocked by someone. So session 132 is in the payroll module trying to adjust the salary, but he's being blocked by session 145. If you have good instrumentation, then session 145 might be, hey, that's Pete Johnson, the payroll admin on extension 4572. You simply jump on the phone and say, Pete, what the hell are you doing? Commit your damn transaction. Yeah, literally, instrumentation can literally make your job so much easier. And if you instrument, then finding bad SQL or the source of bad SQL is trivial. It literally just sit in the dictionary of views because VDL SQL has the module in it. VDL SQL sets, VDL active session history. All these things contain all that beautiful instrumentation code in there. It no longer becomes, oh, here's an SQL. We don't know where it came from. You literally look in the dictionary of views and it tells you because you put that instrumentation in your code. And the cool thing is you get it everywhere, not just those. Like here, I looked in DBA tab columns where the owner assists, where the column module, you know, DBMS application info module gets stored. And like literally there's like 83 catalog views that store this stuff. It's stored everywhere. And people say, oh, I'm worried about overheads when it comes to instrumentation. Well, let's create a little package that calls DBMS application info and run it 10 million times. And it works out on my machine here, I can call DBMS application info, even though it's wrapped inside my own custom package, about 1.23 million times per second. Rest assured, instrumentation costs you nothing and the benefits are massive. And people say, oh, but we don't use PLSQL. 
doesn't matter. You can set the modular action as part of your connection, whether it be .NET, Java, etc. All this stuff is available. Second rant, seeing as people said we don't use PL SQL, if you put your SQL in PL SQL, this also becomes a no-brainer. If you have your SQL in PL SQL, the task is done. And let me give you a little demo of that. Flush out my shared pool. I'm looking for any SQL that says select special column from. There's none in there because I haven't run it yet. Create a table called T, put one row in there. There's my query. Select special call from McDonald.t. If I query Vidola SQL, I can see it's now in the library cache and it shows me what do I get? Well, it says it came from SQL Plus. That's sort of useful. There's no action. It tells me the service. Here's a SQL ID, but that's about it. In terms of identification, this is a SQL that hasn't come from Peel SQL. Really, all I can do is SQL Plus put the module in there for me, luckily. If it was a Java application, it would probably just say JDBC thin client. And it tells me, oh, the parsing user ID was 107. That's me. But even that, I really can't rely on because if that table is available to anyone in the public space, I reconnect as Scott and query it. Guess what? Now it says it was 195 that parsed the query. So if I'm using the parsing user ID in lieu of anything else to try to find out whereabouts the code base it is, it's not really going to help me if it's just plain old SQL coming from a program like SQL Plus or Java, whatever, because whoever last parse it is going to be stored in there. Compare that to this. Flush everything out of the shared pool so it's not in there anymore. Let's put it in a Peel SQL routine. So simply looping through that, it's in, you know, this could be opening a ref cursor. In this case, I'm just looping through it. Run the routine. Now, when I look for that query in the shared pool, guess what? It says, here's your query. By the way, it came from program number 92209 on line three. What's 92209? It's simply, it gives you the name of the procedure from DBA objects or user objects. So any SQL that's in a Peel SQL program, it'll tell you what Peel SQL program it came from, and it'll even tell you the line number that the thing was run from. It's literally that easy to find a SQL statement. If it's a problem one, you just simply look it up in Vidal or SQL, job done. Even if, let's flush out the shared pool, it's gone. Even if it's dynamic SQL. So this is Peel SQL running dynamic SQL. Run the procedure. It still is in there. This time on line five. Any SQL that's issued from Peel SQL, it's going to be tracked within the Peel SQL module so easily. Anyway, that's enough ranting. Let's go back to the slides. Put it in Peel SQL, the job is done. Let's go back to tracing. The supported mechanisms for tracing are generally DBMS monitor. You can turn on tracing for a particular session. You can turn on tracing for a particular client ID, which means once again means you need to be doing some instrumentation, or you can turn it on for a combination of service, module, and action. They're the supported mechanisms for actually turning this thing on. Once again, they're all useful, but they're really relying on you having done some instrumentation yourself, because if you have none, then which service do you turn it on for, which module, et cetera. You're back to this problem of, do I turn it on for everything and have that much trace data? So let's tinker very slightly with unsupported mechanisms. This is one way of doing it at system level. And this is, even though this is commonplace, it officially is unsupported. You older system set events, 10046, which is SQL trace, turn it on, turn it on system-wide, and then use grep for your SQL. You know, that's not a great way of doing it, but that's one of the unsupported mechanisms. But that's the one that people are most familiar with. But the reason I wanted to touch on unsupported mechanisms was we actually revamped the entire event mechanism way back in Oracle 11. We just didn't document it because none of this stuff is documented. You can do something like this. Alter system, set events, I want to do a SQL trace, for this particular SQL ID, and when you see it, get the plan statistics, capture the weights, capture the binds. Uh, that's all on a single line, just I couldn't fit it on the slide. But how cool is this? System-wide, I've turned on a trace, but I'm only going to pick up this particular SQL statement if it occurs, rather than dumping out trace everywhere. Let's do a quick demo of that. Here is my alter system set events. Turn on just for this particular SQL and capture the various bits and pieces. I do a select count star from DBA objects. That's not going to get caught because it's not my SQL. Select count star from T. There's my special statement. And there's another different variant. A normal trace would collect all of those. 
Let's see what happens. So I've turned off my trace. Here is my trace file. I have to disconnect because Windows won't close my trace file until I disconnect and fire up. What's in my trace file? It has all the recursive SQLs in it that were fired as part of this uh, overriding SQL. That's very useful because it picks up dynamic sampling, which can be expensive. But if I scroll down to the end, we can see it only picked up the particular SQL ID that I was interested in, this one. It didn't pick up the other four I ran, it just picked up this one. So it's selectively tracing just a particular SQL. So that's super cool. Using that syntax, and I'll, I'll put this on a blog post or something, you can actually now trace just a single SQL statement. Now you might be wondering, what on earth, where's all this stuff come from? I did mention it's unsupported, so it's not in the documentation, so you're not gonna be able to get it. But some really, really cool references for how you can dig into this are from Cyan, um, I hope you pronounce your name right, Cyan. Uh, he's got a great blog for and Tanel Poda, two fantastic references here um, in terms of getting an idea of what you can access. So the question is, how do we dig into all this stuff? Let's connect a sysadmin. All this stuff comes from a thing called Aura Debug document. And this is how we document some of the internal stuff inside the Oracle database. If I run Aura Debug doc, it says, yep, you can do debugging on events or components. So let's start with events. The reason I've put this out in little plus signs here is I'm about to run this command, but it scrolls a lot. So I thought I'd show what the command is so we'd actually see it and then we, and it flies through. So if I scroll back, you can see it's way back here. It says, doc event says you do an event spec, et cetera, and it gives you some samples of how to set events, et cetera. But it also says what it really is, is an events is a, consists of a name, a scope, a filter, and an action. So let's drill into that. Or a debug doc event name. And these are the names of things that you can set events for. And if we look, one of them, for example, is SQL trace. That's our SQL trace event. We can also do trace. And you can see a whole lot of other stuff, huge amounts of stuff. So I said SQL trace, let's do or a doc event name SQL trace. And it says, if you do a SQL trace, these are the facilities that you get access to. You can ask for weights, binds, plan stat, or level. By working our way down this event hierarchy, we've now seen where this syntax came from. It said, if you're using a SQL trace event, event name, then these are the things you can add to it. You can ask for plan stat, weights, etc. You can ask for various things that tells you what you can do. So it, this explains how this command is built. It hasn't explained how we, if we're allowed to put this SQL ID in, but let's continue. Let's do aura doc event scope. Scope says inside the event scope, you can do a SQL or a queue. And what do we do for a SQL? It says for a SQL, you have to nominate a SQL ID. And so that explains where the rest of it comes from. This is the event name. These are the facilities available to the event name. And this is the scope qualifier to actually narrow that scope down to just a particular SQL. There's also extra filters. So these are all the filters you can do for these various things. I can, for example, say, I want to filter you know, only the third occurrence of this execution of this SQL statement. I want to filter on, a, say, a particular weight. So let's have a look at that. If I want to filter on a weight, it says yes. I could capture, I could trace an SQL, but only capture the information if a weight exceeds a certain amount of time, for example, or P1, for example, if it's a file read event, P1 is the file, I can filter on that as well. I can filter on a process. So I could say, I only want to filter if it comes from a particular operating system process ID. If I know a particular program on a particular session is doing it, program name, particular container, all sorts of goodies. Event actions, event actions are massive. There's just go on and on. These are all the things I want you to do when one of these events is found and triggered. I can say, for example, I want to when the event action is a query block dump, it'll tell me, yep, the parameters for that are you pass in a level that a level is default one. I could then do things like this. I want to do a SQL trace as we saw before. Here's my scope. Here are the actions available for this particular event. But I could also do things like this. I want to get a trace of this component, the SQL optimizer, for this particular SQL ID. And when I get it, I want to do a query block dump at level one, like we just saw. There's this huge 
infrastructure of incredible power and incredibly complicated stuff that you can do. But as I said, did I mention this is unsupported? If you want to tinker with that kind of stuff, for the love of all that is holy, do not do this on production if you don't know what you're doing. All this stuff is really to be engaged with by Oracle support in emergency situations. Probably SQL Trace is the one exception. If you want to go in there and start saying, okay, yes, let's find a particular SQL statement. And when I find it, let's corrupt my control file. Guess what? That's going to end very badly for you and your database. So there's a huge amount of power in there, but generally these things are undocumented for a reason because they're really meant to be used only under the supervision of Oracle support. But just so you understand where this new syntax is coming from, there's some facilities there that let you actually explore and go further for that. Thank you.